I'll be discussing today what we know about disparities in chronic disease in Canada and leave, with, leave you with some thoughts on what we don't know. First up, I would like to provide you with a brief overview of Tai Hai, who we are and, and what we do. Tai Hai's mandate is to remain neutral and objective and to deliver quality, unbiased information on Canada's health system and the health of Canadians. We are not policy makers, but we provide relevant and reliable data and analyses to those who do formulate the policies that shape Canada's healthcare system. The Canadian Population Health Initiative, which is the branch that I'm attached to, takes a population health approach to its work by examining the factors that influence health and interactions between diseases, health outcomes and social determinants of health. I first like to talk about what is chronic disease. So a chronic disease is a condition that is long-standing, not easily or quickly resolved. The burden of, of chronic diseases is actually high and, and it's due to conditions such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory disease, di diabetes and mental illness. So how do we identify inequalities in chronic disease? We can do so by looking at it through a population health lens. We tend to look at inequalities across factors such as health status, health service use and access and health outcomes. And we do so by stratifying each aspect of health by population characteristics such as age, sex, social economic status, ge geography and ethnic groups. I'll just be presenting data today on disparities according to social economic disadvantage, but further information on the health of rural Canadians, seniors, males, females can be found on the Tri High website. We will also be producing a report later this year on the health of Canada's Aboriginal populations. Looking at differences according to social economic disadvantage is often a challenge, as many of the social economic status information like employment income, education, living arrangements are not routinely available through data collections. As such, area-based social economic measures is often used as a proxy as this information is available from census for small areas which can then be linked to other data collections. So what do we know about inequalities in chronic disease in Canada? I'll be drawing data from a series of reports and analyses that the Canadian Population Health Initiative have undertaken over the last five years. However, one of the challenges that we face in producing reports on health inequalities is the limited available data on social, economic, cultural and environmental determinants that influence health. Most of the health data routinely collected reflects service activity and does not capture these factors. So much of our analysis to date has only scratched the surface in terms of fully understanding the extent of health inequalities in Canada. So what do we know? We know that the burden of chronic diseases is high, especially those for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So these are conditions such as COPD, diabetes and heart disease, which are conditions that can be managed on an outpatient basis. We know that these conditions affect over 7 million Canadian adults it accounts for almost 100,000 hospitalisations each year and 13,000 deaths. However, we also know that the burden of these conditions are not shared equally among all population groups, with those that live in rural areas and low-income populations more likely to be affected by these conditions. Now, if we have a look at this figure, if we look at the um, columns on the left-hand side of this figure, we can see that hospitalisation rates for ambulatory care sensitive conditions for people living in low social economic status areas is almost twice as high as those living in high social economic status areas. We also know that hospitalisations for these conditions in rural areas is almost twice as high as for those in urban areas. We have also found that the extent of disparities differ depending on what specific type of health measure is it is examined. For example, if we look at the right hand side of this figure, we can see that the prevalence of these ambulatory care sensitive conditions is sort of around 40% higher for people living in low social economic status areas compared to high SES areas. And yet, when we look at hospitalisations, 
we see that the rates for those for low SES areas is almost twice as high as those in high social economic status areas. Also, if we looked at the urban and rural splits, we can see that the prevalence of these conditions in rural and urban areas are, or are similar, around 27 to 25 percent. And yet again, if we look at hospitalisation rates, we can see that the hospitalisation rates in rural areas is about 50 percent higher than in urban areas. So this may suggest that the treatment and management of these conditions may not be as appropriate or as effective for some groups of the population. Now looking into further detail at the hospitalisations for specific conditions, we see that large disparities exist according to social economic disadvantage across a range of health measures such as mental health, injuries, asthma and for many of the most prevalent chronic diseases in Canada. In particular, we see large disparities for mental health with hospitalisation rates twice as high for those living in low social economic status areas compared to high social economic status areas. We also see large disparities for diabetes, for COPD and for substance related disorders. Consistent with these patterns, we also see that those in the lowest income group were 20% less likely to rate their health as excellent or very good compared to those in the highest SES group. So we can see this from the bar on sort of a third from the right. And this may also help to explain why, why we are seeing um, those in the low social st status areas also are more likely to report activity limitations. There are a range of factors influencing the higher burden of chronic conditions and overall ill health among social economically dis disadvantaged populations. Some of it can be explained by health behaviours that influence the onset and progression of these conditions. For example, smoking rates are twice as high among those in the lower social economic status area and rates of physical inactivity are also higher. And we know that these factors are key risk factors for many of the chronic diseases in Canada. So how, so how do these disparities in inequalities translate into treatment and care patterns within healthcare services? Let's, let's take primary healthcare as an example. Are there inequalities in accessing primary healthcare services? I'm now going to be taking some results from a report that was just recently released on disparities in primary health care experiences among Canadians with ambulatory care sensitive conditions. This analysis has shown that not all Canadians with certain chronic conditions are receiving optimal access to primary health care services or an appropriate level of care. We found that those in the lowest income group reported being high users of primary health care and um, high visits to the emergency department for conditions that they perceived as being treatable by the primary health care physician. If we look to the left hand side of this figure, we can see that, lo that um, low income individuals have on average six contacts with their family physician per year this compares to around three contacts for those for high income individuals. We also, we also can see that low income individuals are twice as likely to visit an emergency department for a condition that they perceived as treatable by the primary health care physician. Yet despite being high users of primary health care, they experience challenges in receiving the clinical care and support required to manage their chronic conditions. In fact, they are 30% less likely to report that their physician involves them in clinical decisions or helps them make a treatment plan. Strengthening primary health care for all Canadians by addressing disparities in access to and experiences with primary health care has the potential to result in considerable savings to the health care system. We know that there are some specific initiatives at the health region level that address disparities in access to primary health care, such as um, subsidies for prescription drugs, food supplements and sort of transportation options. However, more can be done to further eliminate the gaps in care that exist for at-risk populations. 
We know that inequalities in healthcare cost us and the economic impact is often the driver needed to implement change. So here is just one example of the potential savings to the healthcare system by reducing health inequalities. So if all social economic areas had the same hospitalisation rates for ambulatory care sensitive conditions and mental illness as the most affluent areas, rates could be reduced by 33 to 40 per cent. This amounts to approximately 400 million in potential savings that could be achieved by eliminating disparities in hospitalisation rates associated with social economic status. I, I would now like to conclude and leave you with some thoughts on what we don't know. There is a need to move beyond just measuring inequalities in chronic disease prevalence and or health service utilisation. How can we look at the contribution of personal health behaviours through a broader social and economic lens? Which interventions are the most effective? Which have sustainable impacts? Which ones distribute their effect equally across the population? What are the economic impacts of these interventions? How can we best study and evaluate them? How can we best scale them up and deliver them? Thank you.